I remember the first time you went up front. I, I'll tell the whole church what I told Jane about Dan. He came up and preached, and I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to him, and I said, man, that's a long way from what's an Adventist. And then I turned around to Jane and said, that was a pretty good pickup on the volleyball court, wasn't it? <laughs> so. Anyway, okay. I won't go with all the jokes and all the things, but I will tell you I know many of you, and um, it's been a long time. Carol and I left Green Bay in about 2004, and um, I have tried to leave Wisconsin three times. <laughs> I have been thrown back here. I have decided that the Green Bay area, Wisconsin, is my Nineveh. I have been spit out of the whale literally three times and come back. So for the last 10 years, we've been living in Sturgeon Bay, and um, Carol said she would not move again. She does not care where I go and work. She's <laughs> not moving again. So I think there was a message in there. The message that I wanted to bring today has to do with, it's kind of an odd title. I, 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 I thought about what I said, prayer armor. Really? Okay, well, I'm combining two things. But um, I wanted to share one other thing. There was a gentleman, and I'm thinking, who was talking about the chaos in the world? for the prayer request. I mean, I just, I just love this verse. I read it this morning. It's 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And, you know, that's just filling. <laughs> so I asked Dan if he would read um, Romans. What was it? 13? Verse 12. And it's just, I'm just going to start there for a minute. I've been telling everybody I quit preaching and I just started talking about things that I was learning and reading. And I found that when I stand up here and try to preach, uh, nobody enjoys it. <laughs> Sometimes if I just share with you what I've been reading and what it means and how you can put different things together. Scripture is so cool. I spent 10 years, a lot of time, I mean, I'm the son of a minister, tried to escape that, be have, have worked in every, you know, all of the churches, and I finally realized a few years ago that I was guilty of everything that sometimes I was trying to help people with. Um, I could tell you every church rule. I could tell you every quote. I could tell you what all scripture meant. And I really don't think that Christ was in my heart the way I'd like to have had him there. And that's a personal choice. And I, 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 I stand here before you today a humbled man because I didn't know anything. But I will share with you what I learned. And when you read in Romans 13, and actually it says, the night is far spent, the days at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. I love the word put on. It's like, there's something we can do here. My favorite way to go through scripture and just read and look at scripture is to find words and phrases that are used in different places. Because frequently, if you find something that's used two or three times, it strings together. And just right below there, it says in verse 14, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So we've got an opposite. And um, what we've got, meaning put on the light, put on Jesus Christ, so the light is Jesus Christ. And where would we find that? In John 1, 1 to 5. You guys have all read this. The book of John, I keep telling everyone, is just one. It's my favorite book. And it literally says, you know, I need to calm down. You guys aren't threatened, are you? 
Why am I nervous? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So what am I trying to paint here? We start with Romans 13, and we're talking about light. We're talking about we're being told to put on something, the light, armor of light. And we just the verse below, we learn that the light is Jesus Christ. And then we know that we're told in John that the light was with God in the beginning, and it is God. And so I just focused on that, and I started thinking about, man, how cool is that? Now, if I was going to put on something, what would I put on? How do you wear light? You guys all know this. Believe me, I don't bring anything new to the table. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Smart people mark these in their Bible before they get up here. Okay. There are three things that I want to compare today, and this is really the start. We're told to put on the armor of light. We've already established what, I, what it really is. Let's look at the armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. Remember I said, if you hear the same little phrase somewhere, frequently it goes together. Put on, put on. So now we're going to put on the whole armor of God and that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we're wrestling with principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness out of here and in high places. So take unto yourself the whole armor of God and having done so, or that you'd be able to stand evil, it's stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Okay. So you guys know this armor. But we're going to do a review. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. And then we go on to the breastplate of righteousness and the feet, which is the gospel of peace, and the shield, which is faith, and on and on. But I'm thinking about the loins, because this is a really cool picture. When you think of this armor of God, what do you see? As we go through here, you know, I mean, if you read in the SDA commentary or many places, it'll tell you that these are listed in the order that a Roman soldier would have gotten dressed. He's girding on the, the, the skirt about the middle. He's got the breastplate. Then he's putting his greaves and shoes on. Then he's got the helmet going. He picks up his shield. He's got his sword, okay? So that's kind of the order they did. Well, I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, what in the world... And why would God tell me to girt about my loins with truth? You know, that's, that's right here. It's your hips. It's the strength right here in your thighs. We're told to stand. Remember, we just read before that we put this on so we can stand firm. And so we take truth. How many times are we told in Scripture who truth is? I am the truth. Christ is the truth. So we're going to girt the strongest part of our body. These hips, you know what they're for? Real quick, the hips support the weight of your body. The hips allow you to walk, run, and jump, or stand firm. And your hips are also flexible. So you can make a decision whether you want to look left or right. I think standing firm says stay in the middle. <laughs> but... This, the hips, it's kind of cool. Put on truth so that you can start in a firm standing foundation based on Christ. 
And then we're told, hey, let's throw on the breastplate of righteousness. I mean, the breastplate, what are you protecting? Your heart. You're protecting your lungs. If your heart's not beating and your lungs aren't breathing, you're not standing. But remember, you're standing in truth, and you've got, you've got the breastplate of Christ, righteousness, your breath beating through your life. And then we talk about the feet, the gospel of peace. And Christ tells us, he brings in his whole message, peace, I am peace. Put on your feet and stand firm. And as you go through the day, as you go through life, walk in peace among your friends and your brothers and bring that message of peace. And I find it's like we always get this Roman centurion view. And if you look this up, the armor of God on the internet, which it's just like, man, there's some really tough looking guys fighting for God, wearing the armor of God. That's the way it's drawn. And I find that right in the middle of this armor is peace. And then you pick up your shield of faith. Christ is my faith. By faith we live. By faith, by faith, by faith. Noah, Moses. <laughs> Noah and Moses together. Noah's. Um, it's just, you know the verses. <laughs> And then you put on this helmet of salvation. And what are we protecting? What are we doing? Mind. Think on Christ. May your every thought be Christ-centered. May your every thought be focused on how you can present Jesus. And, 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 and I, it's the moral uh, zone in our brain and where we make choices and where we decide for right or wrong. The salvation of Christ is a helmet. And then the sword. Have you ever noticed that the word sword, if you drop the S, becomes word? So now we've got the sword word and then we've got descriptions of Jesus and what comes, or Christ and Revelation, and uh, I believe it's Isaiah, out of his mouth is a double-edged sword. Out of his mouth is the word of God. Out of his mouth, he speaks righteousness and peace. So as a warrior, I get this really cool picture of this person who I want to be. I'm standing girt about with truth, which is Jesus, breathing and beating our righteousness, which is Jesus, walking in peace in the shoes of the gospel, protecting my mind and my thoughts by the helmet of salvation, holding a shield of faith that extinguishes darts and enemies, and it's out here beyond me, so it stops it here first, so it doesn't hit me here, and then I act on that. And then for my only protection to attack is the word of God. How many times did Christ say, thus saith the Lord, or the scriptures say? The answers that we give are sufficient from scripture. However, frequently, we stop here. The rest of this doesn't get drawn on the Roman centurion on the internet when I go and look at pictures. I really was trying to find a cool picture. Didn't make it. There's one more. If you look in verse 18, because we've gone through them all, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. There were, if you take... Beat this to death, guys. Loins are one, breastplate two, feet three, shield four, helmet five, sword six. Praying always is number seven. And it's part of that armor of God. And sometimes I hear the presentation and I see the picture, 
But I think of this as it's the glue. It holds it all together. Can you not see that as maybe the cloak, the final thing that they put on? Pray without ceasing. Pray for, in 19, you got to love this, and pray for me. That's what Paul said. Remember when Paul wrote this, he was chained up in Rome somewhere. So, and he said, pray for all the saints, pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That verse is the seventh piece of the armor of God. Glues it together. I found this really neat little verse in Proverbs 9, 1. And I've always wondered what that is, and I'm just going to say, for me, this is an answer. I'm sure there's many. But Proverbs 9, 1 says, Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Is that not cool to hew out your house? You are a house unto God, and your seven pillars or it can literally be the armor of God. Truth, righteousness. Gospel of peace, faith, thou salvation, the word of God in prayer. We just ran through the whole life of Christ. And we're told to put it on and to wear it. Um, I was thinking... You know, it's, it's so often I think we think of this warrior attitude that we're supposed to take it all on and go fight for the Lord. And it's really our protection in a world of powers and attacks, and it's our firm foundation because we're rooted in the Word and in God. You're not required to correct everything that is done wrong around you. You're required to say, thus saith the Lord and the Scriptures. I've got, so one last point with this prayer. Remember, Paul just said, pray for the saints, pray for me, and pray without ceasing. He didn't say, pray that you win the battle, or pray that you beat somebody, or, the, you know, I mean, so it was like, pray for others. And I was thinking on that, too. You know, we have examples of Jesus so much uh, spending all night in prayer. He wasn't praying for himself. He was asking to be filled with the Spirit that he could fulfill what he came here to do. But it was prayer. He was at the seventh armor in his prayers. And then he's in constant communication with his Father through prayer. Pray without ceasing. The night that he went into Gethsemane, remember, he asked the disciples with him, pray with me. He knew what was coming. Pray with me. And basically he said to them, pray so you can be firm and withstand what is coming. And, and in, in specifically in Peter, uh, Peter were told that and I think it's Luke 22, Satan has asked for you. So, there's a point here in prayer that's really kind of cool. Sticking with the prayer, Jesus said, pray you guys. Peter slept. He said, Satan has asked for you pray. He slept. I found in the Desire of Ages here, pray page 713, it says, it was in sleeping when Jesus bade him watch and pray that Peter prepared the way for his great sin. All the disciples by sleeping in that critical hour sustained a great loss. Christ knew the fiery ordeal through which they were to pass. He knew how Satan would work to paralyze their senses that they might be unready for the trial. Therefore, it was that he gave them warning. 
Had those hours in the garden been spent in watching and prayer, Peter would not have been left to depend upon his own feeble strength. He would not have denied his Lord. Seems a little far from the armor of God, but not really. Prayer, power, protection. We let God protect us. When we act on our own, we are left to stand against the fiery darts. I have um, another thing <laughs> that when I, when I was putting this all together, it, 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 it just amazing to me how you find so many things that can bring the same concept. Um, just jump with me and don't, don't, don't judge yet. <laughs> Let's talk about Job. In the f- we all know the story of Job. Rich man on earth had everything, the most beautiful daughters, the most camels, the most horses, the most mules, the most everything, and the wisest and greatest man in the east. And he lost it all. And Satan asked for Job. In the first chapter of Job, you remember it talks about his children? He had all these wonderful children, and the children would have parties, and they went feasting. And Job worried about his kids. And it says in the first chapter of Job that he would routinely offer sacrifices for lest they had sinned against the Lord. So he would routinely offer sacrifices and pray for his children. Pray for others. Paul told us, Pray for all the saints. Christ said, pray for me and you. Pray for others. Job prayed for his family. And then I I, I looked at that and I thought, I get it. So we're gonna we're going to skip everything but let me just I'll just summarize with Job you have this picture of this man who prays for his children he's attacked by evil but he failed not he withstood it his family his acquaintances everybody we've got these wonderful discourses of wisdom talking about why he should do what he should or just curse God but he never did so I found this really cool thing in Job. If you look at Job, verse chapter 42, Job 42, and we're going to take a look at this. All right. This really wasn't about Job. This is about Job praying, by the way. <laughs> so... And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against you and against my, thy, your friends. For you have not spoken of me the right thing that is right as my servant Job has. Therefore, take seven bullocks and go and the rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for while I, for him will I accept. Okay. So, once again, a praying man praying for others and not for himself. So, you know, it's not that we don't pray for ourselves, but the gospel of peace tells us to be concerned for others, and have prayer for others. And this is the verse 10. We all know that Job got everything back. I mean, that's real. That's the part that we hear most often. But look at what it says, and I'm reading out of the King James, but in verse 10 it says, and the Lord turned 
the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And then he gave him back as much as he had before and twice. We are called to be a warrior of God, to put on the light of God. And just think in the morning when you get up, Dan, you get up and you go to work and you put on your protective gear. Why don't you just envision when you get up and spend that moment with God that you're going to get dressed in the armor and the light of God. Don't you long for the day where you literally have the light recircling about you? Is this not what Adam and Eve lost when they sinned? The armor of God, the light that surrounded them, the presence of God, the mind of God, what we were designed to be. And through Christ, we can have that in this earth, in this body that we are in now, as weak as it is, we can put on this very cool Christ-like protection for us. And those are the things we do, and we pray for others. And the cap of Job was removed when he prayed for others. 